you're not going to catch me buying a $500 purse. I don't have stuff worth $500 to put in the purse. So I'm not <laughs> buying that. <laughs> Welcome Diamond Nation, Salem here, always here with my co host and friend, Sal. Welcome you guys to another edition of Africa's Diamond. Um, we are having conversation with African changemakers throughout. Sal, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing well, Salem. Diamond Nation, how are you guys doing? This is our second podcast interview and we have for you today Cola, who is founder of Beta Motivation. This woman is a go-getter. I mean, she's doing some incredible things. You're going to hear about the newer things that she's actually working on right now. You're going to hear about how she came to found Beta Motivation, what Beta Motivation is all about. So you don't want to miss this. This is going to be a huge treat. I'm excited for you guys to check out what Cola has to say. Let's take a step back and let's give Diamond Nation a picture of how you you became who you are today. And, and in our pre-interview process, you mentioned that you were a regular kid a regular Nigerian kid. And I, I just I just wonder, what does the life of a regular kid in Lagos, Nigeria, look like? Tell us what your upbringing was. What did you grow up around? Yes, yeah, so I'm on Niger, live and direct. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So my my family was pretty pretty straightforward. It was uh, get home at this particular time, do I food from Bukas, don't pick money from the floor. I, we lived in Lagos for the most part, but my dad briefly ventured into politics, and so we moved to Quara for a while while he was doing that. So that's, those are the two places I know best in Nigeria. And I, I went to boarding school. I went to Quince College. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's where <laughs> I went to school. <laughs> and uh, I, I hated it. I absolutely hated boarding school at the time, but... Looking back, I would never trade that experience for anything else because it has really shaped the kind of person that I am. There's no circumstance that I can find myself that I would feel discouraged as though I couldn't make it out of there because in my mind, if I can survive six years of boarding school in Queen's College, there is nothing I cannot survive. So if, you, if you're curious about our family or anything like that, I'm more than happy to share, but there wasn't anything particularly fantastic about how we grew up weren't filthy rich or anything like that with just the regular family trying to not get killed and trying to avoid arm robbers and things like that. Exactly, exactly. Talking about arm robbers, I think Salem's got the next question, but I gotta make this interjection. I'm 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 a neighbor of yours. I'm from Ghana. And uh, my parents really? got uh, yeah, yeah. My parents got um robbed a few a few months ago, so that's a real problem. And Diamond Nation, oh. someone needs to solve that security problem for our continent. Please do something. All right. I'm telling you. I'm t- you both your parents are from Ghana? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. If I ever moved back home, I would. I think Ghana would take precedence over Nigeria for where I would move to. Well, mainly really? because I think, I've had, I think I've just had better experiences in Ghana than I have in Nigeria. But then again, I've... I've lived longer in Nigeria than the time I spent in Ghana, so that's obviously skewed, but it was a great experience. I think I, I was in Accra. People would always greet you in the morning, and it was just chill. It was a little more, it was more laid back than Lagos, which I think was nice. A nice it was a nice break from Lagos. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I, I know a lot of Ghanaians who are in Nigeria um, in, in, in startup world and stuff, but that's an interesting perspective. So talking about your childhood, one other thing you mentioned to us was the, the fact that you and your brother had started a very interesting business. What was that business? <laughs> what were you guys doing? We were selling cashew juice. And cashew apparently juice. A lot, cashew juice. Apparently a lot of people aren't aware of that this is a thing that can even exist. So for those of you in Diamond Nation that don't know what that is, the cashews that we eat as nuts actually come from a bigger fruit, and that fruit has really good juice. So my brother and I started selling that to all our parents' friends. Huh. <laughs> so <laughs> your parents found out. Basically, what ha- how it all started was my mom showed up at home, and she bought a ton of cashews. And... I really liked them, and one thing led to another and found out that we could just get juice out of this thing, and we get a lot of juice out of each cashew fruit. 
So I recruited my brother, and then we started stealing cashews from my mom's kitchen and squeezing the juice out of the cashews and bottling them in water bottles that were empty. And we would sell them to our parents' friends. We would go to the neighbors, and we would sell the juice, and everybody bought. They, everybody seemed to like it. We don't know if they actually drank it, because what they would buy the, <laughs> the juice from us. And eventually my parents found out that we were doing that, and they were okay with it. But then the day they saw how we were getting the juice out of the cashews, they just shut the whole thing down. We were literally using our bare hands with our dirty fingers and squeezing cashews in the kitchen. And my parents oh my didn't goodness. think that was a very smart idea. So that's yeah. kind of how that business <laughs> that's kind of how that business died. But it was fun. We we made quite a bit of money from it. We even got orders, people asking us to bring it to their house. So it was fun. It was fun while it lasted. Yeah. So something we could talk about related to that that I think Dominique should be interested in is you're growing up in Africa and you have an entrepreneurial vision or a picture of a problem you solve, a product you could create, and you went ahead and did it. What Describe for me your mindset there because that's something that a lot of people are struggling with is they have to fight with authority figures and they have to fight with uh, quote-unquote the system and uh, not be able to really rise above. But you did that. You and your brother did that against all odds, um, and uh, it was a start for you. So what, what could you say about the mindset, what, what really made you take the action and not just have an idea? So there are two things I'm going to mention really fast. And the first is that there are certain people that are planning-oriented and certain people that are action-oriented. And I think that both types of people are equally valuable, and the best partnerships are when that action-oriented person finds a planner and they can work together. I Mm -hmm. tend to be type A. Once I have an idea, I just want to go for it, and then I plan as I go. So Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate to have people around me that are more reserved and would do a lot more planning and not necessarily act. So I'm very fortunate to have that balance in my life. But... Mm -hmm. The second thing I would mention is that I grew up around entrepreneurs. Both my parents are business owners. My dad has always run his own show from from the day I was born. I've never known my dad to work for anybody. And my mom started her first business, I believe, as far as I recollect, when I was five. So I grew up around people that have always flipped the middle finger to the status quo and just done exactly what they wanted to do, and I watched them mm-hmm. be very successful at it. So I think that that is a very huge advantage because I don't know the other side. I don't know, I don't have an example of anyone in my life that wanted to do something and didn't go for it. Everybody I ever Mm -hmm. saw growing up always went for what they wanted and usually succeeded at getting it. So that has just programmed my mind to believe that if there is something I want, I can just go do it. And if it doesn't work the first time, Mm -hmm. maybe it would work the second time around. That's really wow. awesome. Wow. That's passionate. You know, Cora, um, as I'm back here, I, I kind of had a question as you were talking a little bit of growing up in that environment of parents who were go-getters, who kind of went after their dreams. How was the transition of you growing up in Lagos, in Nigeria, coming to the U.S.? You know, because obviously that had to be a different environment in a different setting. How would, um, let's say, how did coming to the States how was this transition, and how did that further you into more of your entrepreneurial uh, dreams and goals that you had? That's a really, really great question. I'm glad you asked that question. Transitioning from the U.S., um, from Nigeria to the U.S. was interesting for me because, unlike you, I wasn't smart enough to realize that this was a transition. I showed up mm. in the U.S. <laughs> with exactly the same mentality and exactly the same mindset, and I just I didn't anticipate that there would be a transition. To me, it was Mm. just, these are the things I want to achieve, and I'm going to get them done. And I remember there were people that would tell me, for instance, there was a time I wanted to work for a certain company, and the people that were supposed to be encouraging me and helping me with the applications kept telling me, oh, they would never hire you because you're an international person. And I thought, what do you mean they're not going to hire me? Don't you know how great I am? I'm going to get this job. (laughs) And so I worked very hard to get it. I didn't get it the first year, but I got it the second year. 
And so that mm. just reinforced for me that, yeah, it's a different environment, but the basics of getting things done don't really change too much. It still boils down to knowing what it is that I want and ignoring people that tell me that I can't do it without giving me any reasons why it can't be done. Just because it didn't work for you doesn't mean it's not going to work for me. But right. I will say that staying, being in the U.S. does do something to, at least for me, it does do something to my motivation that I do not like which is that there's that tendency to become very comfortable and very complacent and not be as driven as when you have actual things to battle against. In Nigeria, you have actual things to fight against. You have mosquitoes, you have NEPA, you have water issues. <laughs> there are right. things that, that, that give you that edge, that give you that drive, that make you want to go out and do stuff no matter how hard it is. But here, it's so easy, it's very easy to become complacent. So I find that I cherish the times that I can go back home and light my fire again and remind myself mm. of why I want to do the things that I want to do. So mm. I don't know if that answers your question very well, but I think that people that come here, knowing that there will be a transition period, might be better prepared to handle things. But for mm. me, I just came here thinking, these are my goals, I'm going to get them done. And I'm going to step on anything that tries to stand in my way. And I have to learn to adjust. <laughs> I have to learn to adjust and do things in a, in a more productive way. And I think so far it's been working for me. Are you okay with going down a road that uh, I read in your book? Okay, I'm going to ask it, and I know you'll be okay with it. I read your book, and Diamond Nation, you've got to go get this book, Story, Story by Cola. Uh, it's just exactly. amazing, and we're going to have a link to it under this podcast. But in your book, you talked about an interesting experience that I would call a bottom experience. I mean, you, you hit bottom, um, and you had just graduated with an incredible degree, and you found yourself doing a job that you probably would have <laughs> never done, ever, had the choice. Tell us that story, because I want Diamond Nation to, to ex- understand that sometimes you have to experience things that you don't want to to kind of wake up to the things that you really want to live. Right, right. Yeah, so without giving everything away, not to spoil the story for people that haven't read it yet, but yes, you are exactly right. I did hit a point where I absolutely hit rock bottom. I had my bank account was not smiling at me. I was working at a minimum wage job. I was just wondering how my life had turned out that way because, like I've been saying, I grew up in an environment where people went for what they wanted and generally succeeded. And to be the person in the family that was in the U.S. doing this job that made absolutely no sense compared to where I wanted to be, it was just a very, very low point in my life. And I found and something I actually didn't mention in the book that, was also happening was I didn't have very many people that I could tell that this was what was going on in my life. So mm. it was also very lonely to have friends call me and then I'm like, oh, I'm okay, everything's fine. But in reality, I'm thinking, what am I doing? Am I even going to be able to make it out of here? So that was a very, very, very low point for me. And a series of events happened that got me out of that situation. But I wouldn't wish that on anyone. It, was, it wasn't fun. It wasn't, it wasn't a fun time at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. How did you, how did you um, get over the fear of, so now you go through that pretty much the, like what Sal referred to as a bottom situation. How did you go from that into getting started into like what you're doing now? So how, how was that, uh, I don't want to call it transition, more of an awakening. How was that awakening from the just being in a, such a mess to, you know, doing the amazing things you're doing today. Like, I, I'm, I'm sometimes just amazed at some of the things you're doing, so I want to know what, what was that passion that was kind of burning, saying, okay, no more of this, let's make the change. So Steve Jobs said something, and I'm sure everyone listening to this has probably heard Steve Jobs' medicine address. And in that address he delivered at Stanford, which was one of the things that I listened to during that period, and it really transformed my thinking. He said, life never makes sense looking forward. It only makes sense looking backwards. At Mm. that point in time, I couldn't have told you these are the five steps I'm going to take that would get me out of this. It's only looking back that I can see that, oh, 
this is the path that led me out of this. So looking back, the first, one of the biggest things that happened during that period for me was even though it was hard and I wasn't happy and I just felt everything was falling apart, I found it was during that time that I found my passion for writing. And today Mm -hmm. I'm an author. So it wasn't wasted. It was during that time that I discovered that I have a creative side. I tend to be very logical. I have a degree in computer science as well. So I tend to be very process-oriented, but it was during that period that I discovered certain things about myself that I'm using today. And even though I discovered that, oh, I like to write, oh, I can do this blogging thing, oh, I can explore how all this works together, that alone didn't get me out of it. Finding certain things I was good at alone didn't do it for me. It had to come down to my second round of drama with... um, the relationship that went south Mm -hmm. in a very dramatic way, that was, Mm. I would say, another trigger for me where I finally woke up and said, you're too comfortable. Your situation is horrible, but you're comfortable in this horrible situation. You're working this horrible job, but as you're doing it, there is air conditioning there. So you're, you're far too comfortable in this. But when that relationship just went south, it made me, just sit down and think about my life and dream again. It made me realize that I had become accommodating. I had been accommodating things in my life that had no place in my life. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I made that decision, my mindset changed and my choices changed. And I, I quit that job without really knowing what the next job would be. I got a way better job. I got serious about my money which is something I started talking about more on my blog. I believe that it's great to want to make a difference and change the world, but it's also probably a good idea to be smart with money and know where you stand with that. So mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. Having, that, having that access to Steve Jobs' video, having that experience with my relationship, and <clears throat> changing, excuse me, changing my mindset and refusing to allow things in my life that didn't belong there just helped me to to get to the next level. And once I started getting smart about my money, I started having access to more resources and more people and having more opportunities to use this writing and speaking and everything I learned during my rock bottom period to grow my my future. I get that. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You discover um, sort of at your bottom, you discover an inspirational um, piece of content. It inspires you. You get up off you know your bottom and then you start doing stuff. But the part that I think we we might want to get into a little bit more is it's not that simple to write a book, as you probably know. It's not that easy to start a blog and be as successful as you've been. So maybe on a more practical level, what did you do? Because I know there's a lot of people in Diamond Nation who want to write their stories. They want to put it out there but they don't know what to do, where to start, how to do it. Um, and, and, and maybe you could give us some insight because you're incredibly successful with it. How did you use that skill that you discovered? How did you actually get it going? I love that question. I love it when we get practical. I will say, and I, I, feel, I think I've talked about mindset a lot throughout our conversation, and so I don't think I need to repeat that again. Mindset, mm-hmm. it always starts with mindset. Once I had my mindset right and I decided that that was what I wanted to do, I had to make the time. For me, I'm a morning person. I've been up since 5 o'clock this morning. And so realizing that that was essential for me was something I started doing. So throughout the time I was writing my book, I would be up by 5, 5.30 at the very latest. I would be sitting in front of my computer with my cup of tea by 6, 6.30, and I'm writing. And I would write Mm. for three hours every morning. And I wouldn't Mm. edit what I was writing. I would just write. And I find that sometimes I process my thoughts better when I talk. So I invested about $65 to $100. I forget the exact price on a software called Dragon. And Dragon basically allows you to talk to your computer, and then it it types out what you're saying. I think it's for people that are actually visually impaired. But Mm -hmm. it works very well for me because that's why the book feels like a conversation because for the most part, I spoke through the book. I said the things that are in the book, and then the software typed it up for me, and of course I would have to correct typos and things like that. So 
that's another very practical thing that I did. The third thing was I limited the number of people I was telling that I was working on a book. When I first started, I made that mistake of telling people freely that, oh, I'm writing a book. Mm. And what I found was that it was a lot of undue pressure on me. It was a lot mm. of people asking, oh, when are you going to be done? Are you done yet? What's your book about? And I didn't <laughs> like that. I wanted it to be a book that I was writing from my heart. I wanted it to be a book that would actually help people. I wanted it to be honest. And I just found it very difficult to be those things and have all these people asking me about it. So I stopped telling mm. people that I was working on a book until I was ready to start promoting. So I guess that's the third practical thing that I did. Mm. So you, you committed time to actually get the job done that you set out to do. You used resources that were available to you, and you understood the pressure and, and how to manage that with talking to people about it, right? That, those are, exactly. Did I summarize that well? Okay. Yeah, because you did. I think um, – I mean, those are those are incredible pointers, and um, and, and, and for Salem and I, just diamond nation. This is this is real. This is real stuff. If you want to get stuff done, you've got to listen to what Cola is saying. Salem and I are practicing this right now, getting this stuff done, and, and um, that's 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 real, real good. Thank you for sharing that. Now you talked about saving money, and it's a mm. big thing, a big theme for you on your blog. We make a lot of money as people living in a diaspora, people living even on the continent. We don't know this, but we make a lot of money. Would you say that our big problem is not in making more, it's in managing what we make? I mean, I'm sure you would say that, but get into a little bit more uh, technicalities and maybe some, some advice on managing our resources better. So for a person that goes around saying, oh, my big passion is to help orphans and to make a difference, I think that... Some people might be surprised to hear how passionate I am about money. I, I just think that we need to be smart about our money. And then you're absolutely right. I think most people here do make a lot of money. The issue is how that money gets spent and how that money just seems to disappear without any mm-hmm. type of trace of where it's going to. So for me, I, I have goals. I have my earning goals and I have my savings goals. And I don't mess around with those goals. I've already hit my savings goal for 2015. And now I'm looking wow. for what's next. I, this morning I worked on my investment plan. I'm looking into 3D printing. I'm looking into real estate funds. I'm looking into wow. which other stocks I can get into in the stock market. And unfortunately, I don't think that we talk about these things enough or focus on them enough or understand that now is the time to do all these things. It's not when we're 45 years old with three kids that we should start right. looking into these things. We should start these things now. So... For me, it's all about getting educated, finding the right information, and actually doing the work of saving the money. You're not going to catch me buying a $500 purse. I don't have stuff worth $500 to put in the purse, so I'm not (laughs) buying that. (laughs) I just think it's about making it a priority and being practical with it. I use mint.com to track my goals. And it's mm-hmm. very encouraging to put away that $1,000 and see your tracker move and say, oh, you're three months away from your goal. <laughs> right. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very, it's, it's doable. I think that's the main point that I'm making. It's very doable, and we need to do it more. Wow. I, I, I am um, I'm a big advocate of also of uh, what I call money knowledge. And I love the fact that you're speaking on, on a very practical note. Uh, for example, Diamond Nation, uh, Met.com, a great software. It's free, um, so there's nothing cheaper than that um, to use. It's very effective. But, cool. I, I want you to, to talk a little bit more of a, as we're on this topic about money and revenue, to speak a little bit on the success that you've seen with your, uh, the, the company and the endeavors that you're, you're doing now, even with the book sales. Uh, what kind of numbers have you seen with the success of your company so far? So I'm always very shy to talk about specific numbers, and I just think that might be a cultural thing for me that I need to get over. <laughs> okay. But I've been very, very fortunate with Story Story. What I heard before I published my book is that most first-time authors usually don't even break 100 copies of their book sold, mm. which at first, was a little discouraging for me because I thought, wait, what? You mean I would do all this work and then not even sell 100 books? That's really sad. But then, <laughs> and so because of that, when, I, when the book came out, I refused to look at my numbers. And 
my friends kept asking, so how did the book do? I said, I don't know because I haven't looked. I have no idea how much money I made from this or how many copies were sold. But eventually I had to look. The book launched March 23rd. I think I finally looked early June to see how many copies were sold. And I saw that the book sold 6,920 copies, which was wow, way beyond. Red. Thank you. Way beyond anything that I was expecting. And so from the actual book itself, I'm very happy with that result and very happy to see the rankings that it achieved. I was never looking to be in any type of ranking, but people kept sending me screenshots of things they were seeing and see that people were enjoying the book. People I don't know, will never know, were reviewing the book. It got 70-something reviews on Amazon at this point. Oh, okay. And it's just been very, very favorably received, which is great. There are speaking engagements that have come out of the book. And interestingly, I'm limiting the number of speaking engagements I'm doing just because of other opportunities as well. And um, so numbers-wise, I think that that's a, that ought to give an idea of how that's going. I'm still doing consulting work as well, which is still my main source of income right now. It may change with the business that I mentioned earlier in the in our conversation, but that's kind of where my, my figures are. Well, thank you for sharing so candidly with us. And that, that's some real good uh, numbers. Um, you know, Diamond Nation, if you don't know that, those are pretty solid, really awesome numbers for a first-time right. author. Um, and it just speaks to Cola's expertise in the space and, and knowing exactly how to write for an audience. And, and, and really, we're, we're more than excited that you're on here talking with us. So let's get into, we'll get into the end of our conversation. Let's get into more of a passion for you uh, on Africa, what let's do one of two things. You could speak on whichever one you want. What is your number one pet peeve about <laughs> African founders and entrepreneurs or people who want to be African entrepreneurs? And the second, and we want you to be, we want you to be open, be as frank as you can be. <laughs> yeah, hit us, hit us where it hurts. And <laughs> the next question, if you want to tackle it as well is what do you see as the largest opportunity for the continent and people coming from the continent? Those are huge questions. Those are massive questions. <laughs> but I'll answer the first one first. As far as pet peeves go, I, I, I would like to say that I don't have any, but that would not be the truth. I think my greatest pet peeve, not even necessarily with just founders coming from the continent, just with founders in general, is not just going for it 100% or going for things from a place of lack. So just to explain that a little bit better, when a business is started based on lack, if it's something like, oh, these white people are not representing us well on MTV, so let's go start our own black people channel, I can't get behind that idea. That whole, oh, they're ignoring me, so I'm going to go do my own. I do. Mm-hmm. When that's the narrative behind the, the business, I just cannot get behind it for some reason. So I guess you could say that that's a, a pet peeve. And not going for it 100% is where somebody say, says they want to start something, it's a great idea, but then they put up this tacky website or they start and then they don't, they're not consistent or they're just doing things 20% of the way. It just really gets to me because it makes all of us look bad. Mm-hmm. Well, Kola, uh, <laughs> I love the answer that you gave, and especially that uh, – so, so now that you know that some founders can come, you know, into their dreams goals at, at a place of lack, okay, uh, and that's not the case, what would be some resource, per se, um, or some content, material, products that – Certain founders, some from Africa, some from that come of African descent, could get access to uh, that maybe yourself have have gotten access to. Maybe it could be books, it could be audios, it could be uh, some films, some videos that you've got access to. What would be, for example, uh, books that you can recommend to Diamond Nation, or, or it could be three movies or videos. Uh, we found that depending on who the founder that will feature on Africa uh, Diamond that, you know, sometimes others are more visually uh, inclined and others are more into books, 
so what would be some materials that you can recommend to um, Diamond Nation um, for some of our uh, inspiring entrepreneurs out there to read and get a hold of? I am actually uh, an auditory learner, so I listen to most mm. of my books, and I most of my books are audiobooks, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. And so as far as I would recommend books over videos, and I am a huge nerd, and I love biographies. I love to read other people's life stories more than I love to read what they've done. So I would recommend uh, Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. That's one of the few books that I can actually say that I read it, and when I finished, I had to just sit and just think about my life. It was that Mm. good. Mm. We think we know Mandela, but you don't know Mandela until you've read this book. I've turned into such a snob. I will not discuss Mandela with somebody who has not read that book. It's so (laughs) good, and I absolutely recommend it for anyone that's looking to be a leader or improve the world in some way. It's just, I, it's just such a great book. I love it. I wish there was a second part to it, but obviously he's not here anymore, so that cannot happen. I, let's see which other ones. I love the biography of Alexander the Great by Jacob Abbott, and the reason for that is that a lot of people will talk about leadership and greatness and all these things, but I cannot think of anyone minus, well, I can think of one person, but Alexander the Great is somebody that truly embodies all these things, and he did it at a time that was difficult to be a leader and be great. So it's just such a great book to read. It's not exciting or, you know, there is no fireworks when you read it, but it's such a great book. Mm. I really enjoyed it. Business-wise, one of my favorites is Made to Sit by Chip and Dan Heath. Fantastic Mm -hmm. book, especially if you're an idea person trying to figure out how to wait to get people to talk about your ideas remember your ideas, or if you're the type of person that wants to give presentations or speak and things like that, I, I cannot recommend that book highly enough. It's fantastic. Mm. love it. And, of course, buy my book, too, storystorybook.com. I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cola, thank you so much for your time. We're really honored to have you on here. You're full of knowledge, inspiration, experience, and you're just freely giving that to Diamond Nation and to us. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me. It was a really good conversation. Awesome. So Diamond Nation, go on out there. Check out Cola's blog. There's going to be links right below this recording that you're listening to, to her blog, to her book. Buy the book. I guarantee you, you are not going to regret reading Story Story. It will inspire you to take incredible action in your life. Cola has put a lot of work into it. Her blog, Beta Motivation, just what it is. It motivates you to take action, to be a change maker, which is exactly what we're all about here at Diamond Nation. So you guys have a great day. Do something fun. Stay inspired. Diamond Nation, we want to make sure that you guys don't miss any podcasts. Make sure you follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. We are even on YouTube. But more importantly, also have our podcast on iTunes and directly from our website. You can go to www.africanpodcast.com. And on all social media, you can look us up at African Podcast. Our Twitter handle, our Instagram handle, our Facebook handle, you can find us there. We hope that you guys stay inspired and you be the change you want to see. Go out there and do something awesome. See you guys.